Team Human is an ad-free, listener-supported project made possible by teammates like Sean Wilson, T.O., Duncan Slobodzian, Josh, Zach McKinney, Bjarne Panduro Tvekov, Nathan H., and hopefully you. Just go to teamhuman.fm and click on support to find the others who gain access to our Discord channel, my paywalled medium posts, archives of my writing and conversations, and participation in our live Team Human salons in the Kibitz Room. See you there. You're on Team Human, Conscious Intervention in the Machine, an effort to recognize the value we create instead of surrendering it to the engines of extraction, a chance to retrieve the commons, our creative capacity, and our communities of exchange. It's time to stop optimizing human activity for the market and to start optimizing the market for human beings. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and I'm on Team Human. Playing for Team Human today, science fiction author, journalist, and my smartest friend, Cory Doctorow. Sometimes you'll get as far as you can go, and you'll go, well, this is it, right? I, I, I can't, I'm out of steps. It doesn't mean that there are no more steps to take. It just might mean that you're going to have to start all over again. Cory will be sharing his latest thoughts on the many ways our economy and creativity are being hacked by the perpetrators of choke point capitalism. It's time to intervene on our own behalf. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and we're all on Team Human. Lordy Linda, Elon Musk has accomplished a lot in the past week or so. And no, I'm not talking about the new Twitter owner's implementation of the $8 for a blue checkmark scheme or his massive reduction in workforce before rehiring many of them the next day or his proposal for a content moderation council to judge and delete dangerous tweets. Now, I'm more interested in how, really by his own example, he revealed his impotence, as well as that of the social media star he replaced, Donald Trump. And in doing so, Musk has also revealed the inadequacy of any dictatorial approach to technology, business, or politics. It's as if the the air has changed. I don't know if it's if it's just him, but some things changed. So let's just go through what he did fast, just like he did. Right from the get-go, his decision-making process has been imperious and and whimsical, lacking any coherent strategy or awareness of second and third order effects, oblivious to the way choices externalize harm to others, and as performative as a businessman on reality TV. He played to the most sycophantic entourage of hangers-on, all of them trying to win the attention of their cult leader, and then he came out of the gate literally hours into the first morning as chief, spreading fake news and defying all social norms. And no, I'm not talking about Trump, but his replacement at the top of the Twitter troll poll, Elon Musk. And I think the only way to understand him is as the third in a succession of increasingly powerful social media anti-heroes who melted down in front of millions of people. Right, The first was Charlie Sheen, who shortly after getting fired from his sitcom, he proceeded to go on this manic posting streak. Remember, it was like tiger blood and, and winning. And they may not have been potent memes, but Sheen, he had jumped into what we could call the standing wave of social media culture. The Sheen thing, it all occurred immediately after Iran's kind of failed Twitter revolution, when it seemed like the entire platform had become super serious as we collectively witnessed a nation attempting to wrest itself from authoritarian control. And after that, we kind of needed 
comic relief. And Sheen, he just jumped into the Twitterverse like a surfer into the ocean and was carried along by this wave of attention populated less by by true fans than voyeurs hoping to watch the inevitable crash. And Donald Trump, he was the next to take the leap in there. He wasn't really a leader with policies so much as a salesman capable of reading the emotional and entertainment needs of his audience. And he rose to fame by taking down critics like Rosie O'Donnell or posting unattractive pictures of other candidates' wives. His power, you know, such as it was, it derived from his ability to tweet orders to the crowd, you know, turn on Trump and he will turn his followers on you. And many people feared that the worst thing Musk might do, like taking the helm at Twitter, would be to restore the former president's posting privileges. But instead of restoring Trump, I feel like Musk replaced Trump as tweeter in chief. Yes, Musk is to Trump as Trump is to Sheen. And just like his predecessors, Musk is less concerned with his impact than how it plays with the crowd. He just wants attention. Maybe he wants to show he can become the true techno monarch called for in his partner Peter Thiel's political philosophy. But if the last few days were any indication, he also revealed why he could never be entrusted with such power. For just as Trump would threaten his adversaries with the wrath of his Twitter following, Musk is now doing the same to his advertisers. Many brands paused their spending on the platform you know, for a week or so for fear of how the platform was changing. But as Musk saw it, this is a quote, Twitter has had a massive drop in revenue due to activist groups pressuring advertisers, even though nothing has changed with content moderation, and we did everything we could to appease the activist. Extremely messed up. They're trying to destroy free speech in America. So Musk's response to this was to threaten them with what he said was thermonuclear name and shame if this continues. In other words, he's going to use Trump's mob blackmail techniques in business instead of just politics. Advertise on my platform or my army of trolls will mimetically annihilate you. What an elucidating preview of how a techno monarchy might work. Not to mention what a winning inducement for new brands to join the platform and face similar offers they can't refuse. But the net effect of Musk's activities, it was mostly bad for Trump, bad for tech titans, and good for democracy. Musk upstaged Trump just when the former president was looking for some attention. He says he's running again. Did anybody catch that? And and he was trying to influence the midterms. Musk certainly distracted media coverage from Trump's escapades at a pivotal moment. Was it enough to sway the election? I don't know if we'll ever know, but I kind of think it was. More importantly, by enacting uh, what we could call Tiger Blood 3.0, Elon Musk has exposed not only the problem with running a social media network from the top, but also the dangers inherent in giving a social media star so much authority over our world. Luckily, we are all finally getting the message. Oh, and you can find me from now on on Mastodon at Rushkoff at social.coop. Check it out. I think we may be on the verge of having good, useful fun again. Something has shifted. Feel it. It's a rare treat these days to see old friends somewhere other than a Zoom window. So it's a particular pleasure to share this conversation that Corey and I had in my hotel room a couple of weeks ago when we were both there for the Ottawa Writers Festival. I met Corey Doctorow, gosh, maybe 20 years ago at Boing Boing founder Mark Frauenfelder's house in L.A. I remember Mark whispering to me, I've got a young guy from Canada staying with me. He's smarter than us and knows how things actually work, but he's fun. 
And that's still about the best description I can think of. Corey has written a bunch of great science fiction books, Little Brother, Homeland, uh, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, as well as the new book with Rebecca Giblin, Choke Point Capitalism. Corey is great at staring into the abyss of techno-capitalism, seeing the darkness at its core, and then emerging with hopeful, actionable steps to pull ourselves back from the brink. I wanted to talk to you about Taylor Swift. Uh Uh-huh. Because um, she came out with her new thing, uh, new albums, like last night and the day before, or two days ago at midnight and at 3 a.m., and they broke all the records uh-huh. on all the things and sold all these th- all this stuff, and she had a major fight to get back ownership of some of her music. And then what I read in, in Choke Point Capitalism, I, and I had never known that she fought on all of our behalf. Well, on the behalf of all recording artists, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she did this thing where Universal was trying to woo her, And Universal, like the other big three labels, had gotten this giant windfall because they wouldn't let Spotify launch without giving them a giant equity stake. So they owned a big chunk of Spotify. But when Spotify IPO'd, because Universal, Warner, and Sony, the big three labels, had all agreed to take less money from their artists, (laughs) for their artists from Spotify to make Spotify look more profitable, they got a huge return on those shares because Spotify looked like a very profitable company to investors that made made a lot of money. So they got billions of dollars, which were theirs to use as they saw fit. And they all made some noises about returning some of that money to creators. But there's a shell game that they get to play, which is that almost everybody who has a record deal owes their record label money. You start off owing your record right. label money, not just your advance, but also all the expenses associated with your advance. Like they bill you for the champagne at the launch party that they put on and plan right. from the supplier that they buy the champagne from at an enormous markup. And you get whatever it is, depending on what kind of act you are. It might be a 5% royalty. It might be a 15 or 20% royalty, but you get this royalty on your music, which means that the $150,000 that it nominally costs to produce your record will still have an outstanding balance even after you've made millions of dollars Mm. for the record label. And so one of the shell games that the labels had proposed to play was that they were going to, quote, give some money to artists, but all they were going to do is apply it to their outstanding balances. So no money would actually go to the artist. And Swift said, I will only go to Universal if the share is given off the top. You just have to you just have to write people checks, and not just to herself no, using her powers. All, to everyone Swift. in Universal, everybody. Yeah, the largest label there is, which is great. And they, she was worth it to them yeah. to do it. And having Swift have solidarity, class solidarity, is amazing, and we thank her for it. It's not a substitute for actual like structural change, <laughs> right? It's it's like. It is amazing that she did what she did, but all that tells us is that the fact that it, you know, it's like one person made an arbitrary choice tells us that this is not a fair system. Yeah, but then doesn't that mean then, I mean, yes, it's not a fair system, but then if those who make it to there, if Stephen yeah. King does that with authors and yep. and Spielberg does it with filmmakers. Yep. And yeah, it I mean, does Stephen King things. did it when he went and testified against the Simon Schuster merger. It's the right, threat. James Galdufini did it when he was, uh, you know, the Sopranos guy. Yep. And people were saying, oh, you make so much money. And he's like, no, I'm doing this for everyone. This That's is- right. And as the same thing happened when the uh, Hollywood writers, all 7,000 members of the Writers Guild, went on strike against their agents, right. including the ones who their agents liked and were doing good by. It is often the case in these arrangements where you have like a um, an intermediary, like a publisher or a studio or a label, and then you have talent that either through bargaining leverage or because the uh, of sort of cynical planning one person does really well or a small number of people do really well in the same way that like if you go to a midway by 10 a.m there's someone with a giant teddy bear who's wanted at one of the ring toss games uh-huh. and that person walks around all day carrying the teddy bear and lots of people go and play the midway right james gandolfini and and taylor swift and so on. one of the reasons the labels are okay with them having as much money as they do because the labels first preference is to not give anyone any money except for their shareholders and their executives one of the reasons labels and studios and publishers are okay with there being these these winners is that they're the people lugging around the giant teddy bears that lure in the rest of the workforce at substandard wages and you know the difference between that and paying everyone a living wage 
represents a sig- significant savings, even with these like headline figures for for the for the A list artists. There's a significant savings, and it's always short lived, right? It only lasts until the intermediary no longer has to lure people in. So you see this with uh, Twitch, which Amazon bought in 2014. In Twitch, their uh, nominal deal is a 50-50 split, which means that they take half the money you make as a Twitch streamer, hmm. which is a lot. Yeah. But they secretly had a deal where their A-listers got 70%. And they announced recently, in a kind of chest, a kind of hair-pulling way, they said, you know, we have to come clean. We secretly had this arrangement where our A-listers are getting 70%. That is so unfair. We're going to pay them 50%. <laughs> and uh, they had the best reason for it, which was um, our bandwidth costs too much. Now, they buy their bandwidth from Amazon. And Amazon is the company that owns them. Right. So they can market the bandwidth to whatever they wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, Amazon says that Amazon charges Amazon so much to be Amazon that Amazon can't afford to pay its streamers. Isn't it? I guess the the thing I wanted to talk with you about is the way that we as tech thinker, science fiction writer people ended up, at least me, I ended up getting dragged, kicking and screaming into these arguments about business and economics. This is not Mm. what I particularly cared about. It wasn't my expertise. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went back for the PhD in this stuff after Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. AOL, Time Warner merger, after the dot-com crash, after Mm -hmm. social media, after all these uh, uh, elements, uh, uh, strategies of choke point capitalism took hold. And maybe maybe we're slightly good at it because with a programmer sensibility, we could look at economics a little bit more neutrally. Hmm. You know, a little bit like it's a, oh, what is this optimized for? (laughs) Right. So I would say that I, I always had some interest in economics because I've always been interested in labor issues and Mm. and political issues and so on. What I didn't know much about until much more recently was finance. And finance isn't economics, right? Finance is a bunch of like procedures. Right. And finance was not core to early tech companies in part because early tech companies had um, such a favorable cost basis, right? Software is cheap to make. And with the internet, you can kind of multiply the effect of a single creator or a single software author or a small team, and they can support lots and lots of people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sort of you think about like uh, products like Basecamp or, you know, Slack, where you had a small team that were supporting yep. lots and lots of users. All you needed was the angel round. Yeah. That was you, basically it. Yeah. yeah you, you know, that. or you could self-finance yeah. or... You know, if you remember like the shareware days, if you remember just these very exciting moments in technology, yeah, hardware has a lot of of CapEx, capital expenditure. But even then you had people who were, you know, had this like slow ramp up where they would build things by hand and then they would start a small factory and then they would outsource a little bit and so on. It wasn't financialized, right? Like the major success factor of a tech company wasn't its ability to maintain the fiction that its headquarters was in Ireland. And so it didn't owe any tax to anyone, right? It was about much more about whether the technology was good. And what's happened is that as with every other sector, finance has become the central organizing principle. So you mentioned Time Warner, you know, the Time Warner AOL merger was a big deal. The Time Warner Discovery merger much more recent one, Mm -hmm. which resulted in Time Warner looking at the tax code and their balance sheet and deciding that a bunch of shows were worth more dead than alive and canceling shows that had audiences that were making money because the tax break for the write-off was bigger than the expected return for the ongoing right. production. It's why they're empty. It's the same reason there are empty storefronts in my town of Hastings yeah. on Hudson, because the landlords get more on writing off a $5,000 a month expense than they would get for the $2,000 a month rent they could actually get for the, for the so, place. Yeah. So this is financial optimization. And I think that the programmer mindset for finance is ugly, right? <laughs> that when you, when you bring people who view rule systems as something to be explored and hacked, that, you get just stuff like, uh, you know, there's this viral story going around now that ProPublica published about an algorithm that raises your rent. Right? Did you see this? And I it, think so, yeah. It's got all this real-time telemetry. It's doing a bunch of, like, very illegal things where it's gathering data from multiple landlords and allowing them to tacitly collude to raise rents, which is an antitrust violation, like a per se antitrust violation. Totally illegal. <laughs> but mostly what they've done is they've just sort of figured out exactly like a kind of algorithm for when you keep the apartment empty 
when you let a good tenant who's never been laid on their rent go because you raise the rent beyond what they you know they can pay in the expectation based on your telemetry about other units and what they're clearing for that a tenant who will pay more will show up so it's not like this tenant ever failed to pay you exactly what right. you asked for and it's not like this tenant has ever been anything but a great tenant and nevertheless the algorithm kicks them out and the programmer who ran the project gave a, a great money quote literally and figuratively to propublica he said it's better to use the algorithm because people are too sentimental and they don't want to hurt the tenants, right? Mm. And that the, the algorithm is just, it doesn't have a heart. Right. It helps you be inhumane. Yeah. And so, yeah, programmer mindset. I mean, I don't know that it's just programmer mindset. Right. I think finance has had this mindset for a very long right. time, but... Yeah, uh, which is basically how do we either defeat or exploit what we're learning in behavioral economics. Oh, yeah. these people are being too sympathetic with each other. How do we stop that? Or these people, oh, they have a bias towards seeing money for money in the distance, you know, uh, as as smaller. So we'll we'll Sure, but get also that. like how do we do regulatory arbitrage? Like, you know, cryptocurrency is just basically a bunch of things structured to uh, fill into lacuna and in finance regulation. Right? It's not it's not really like anytime you hear fintech, you should just think unregulated bank. That's that's what fintech right. really amounts to. So it's not like they invented something new. They just figured out a way to do something that used to be illegal. Well, by using something that may have been built for a different purpose. Yeah, although I, I would argue that Bitcoin and, <laughs> and its associated technologies, blockchain technologies, were primarily built for that. I know that there are lots of people who make claims that there are non-financial applications for blockchain i've yet to meet a credible one and that is not an invitation for people listening to this to email me and uh, explain right. to me your your well because theory, uh, like me it. you get those emails every day <laughs> yeah but i've engaged with the i hate to call them this but with the young people involved yeah. in, yep. they are they are their intentions are good many, many of them of that's them. true yep and you know you're right and this is why i continue to engage in the subject not to the point of having yet another conversation about why your blockchain is good. But when I l listen to the rhetoric of the people who I think are honest dealers in the cryptocurrency blockchain world, I hear echoes of the things that matter to me. I also <laughs> hear lots of people who are saying things that I'm very antithetical to. And so I'm, I, I, I think there's a mix there. But for the people who are of goodwill, I have time and... You know, I have already done multiple long form articles and yes. multiple hour long podcasts in which I explain it. And it's just not, there's no productive use of your or my time for you to call me up and for you and me to rehash a conversation I've already had. Right. You know, right. I guess. And that's, you know, I feel that way about so many things, but then the things persist. I mean, sure. I thought I could put down the, I thought I could put down the dot com boom after Wired Magazine did its long boom cover. I right. wrote the piece. I explained what was wrong. Right. Yet the industry kept going. It's true. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, there is, I forget whose law it is, but there's someone's One law. One of those which Godwin is kind of people. Anything I guess. that can't go on forever will eventually stop. Oh, good. Right? And uh, <laughs> I mean, how it stops is something else. I, I, I just had lunch with a very dear old friend who's working on environmental activism in Quebec. And we were talking about just how chaotic and awful it is. And we were talking about um, Thomas Piketty and his theory that the 30 glorious years in the, you know, from the 40s to the 70s, when we saw a much more pluralistic distribution of wealth and enormous amount of growth and innovation and much more fairness and just a better place to be, you know, the, the, the birth of all of these social uh, safety nets, that what changed was that the share of wealth owned by the top decile had been mounting steadily since the destruction of the world wars. And it reached a tipping point where once again, they could command policy outcomes. And when rich people can command policy outcomes, it's destabilizing because they say, let's grow ornamental flowers for my gardens rather than the food that you need to eat. And eventually that reaches a tipping point and you get another orgy of destruction, you know, the French revolution, the world wars and so on. And then, you know, out of the rubble where you have a much more pluralistic distribution, because like if 99% of the wealth is owned by 1% of the people, and then you destroy 90% of the wealth, most of it's going to come out of the 99% right. share. Just, just because there's no one else for it to come out of. And so then you get these, these better policies again. And my fear is that the thing that can't go on forever right now is environmental degradation. 
And the way that it stops is not with a reset to a fairer distribution, but with something much more like civilizational collapse. Right. And I'm looking at that civilizational collapse too. And I mean, one of my main concerns is how many intelligent people in my orbit seem to uh, want to accelerate things toward that end. Hmm. You know, whether it's the, the, there's a kind of a, a Marxist accelerationist, you know, the sort of Zizek, like, well, it's bringing you, it's going to be like Trump. It'll just bring the end faster and uh -huh. we'll get this kidney stone out of our, right. out of our system or this sort of the new right adjacent philosophical sense making crowd yeah. who are trying to get us to the stranger tractor at the end of time or reach, you know, Deschardins uh, Omega point, And then we, we rise from the chrysalis of matter or we get to that next fractal emergent state. Are you and I'm talking like, about long-termism? Long and long termism, but them and the the sort of that uh, they're not really banded anymore. But a lot of what I used to hear on the the Rebel Wisdom podcast from these guys talking about this sort of a post Burning Man ayahuasca, where they go with it yeah, is to this kind of mystical eschatology, right? And you know, and 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 it it has shades of Bannon and his Eastern sure. mysticism. So look, I think there's different things going on all at once that are probably feeding off of each other. Right. One is I think that. The way to understand the philosophical origins of the singularity, which at its core is this idea that eventually technology will become so complicated that no one can understand it, is that its adherents tend to be people who once felt like they were really on top of things, and then the world moved past them, and they're, <laughs> they find it much more convenient to think that things are literally incomprehensible <laughs> rather than that they are just no longer able to understand things. Right. Right. Once, après moi, la deluge, right? Once I don't understand how Wi Fi works, no one can understand how right. Wi Fi works. It is incomprehensible. <laughs> yeah, it is too yeah, this complex. Is just nonsense. <laughs> and, you know, I feel that way. As a guy who, who you know, memorized the AT command set in the 1980s right. and was really, really interested in the differences between 802.11a and 802.11b, yeah. I see like 802.11 Wi Fi 6e, and I try to read the spec and I'm like, eh, this is too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, not not too complicated to use, but yeah. like I'm just going to press the right. Wi-Fi six E button, and I'm not going to hold like an opinion, like a technical right. opinion. This is just too complicated, and it's not really too complicated. It's just that, like, you know, in the same way that when conservatives say things used to be simpler and now they're all too complicated, what they really mean is I used to be a child, and my parents used to shield me from complexity. You know, the, the reason that I was able to master the AT command set when my computer scientist father who brought home the Hayes modem that I mm. mastered the AT command set for couldn't is my dad had a job, right? I was a 10 year old. Right. I had nothing else to do. I memorized the AT command set. My dad was busy. Yeah. Right. And like the reason I don't understand Wi-Fi 6E is I've got a job. Right. <laughs> you know, right. you're people to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also, I mean. But yeah, I have a hi-fi brain. You mm -hmm. know, I know how stereos work. Sure, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, and that was hard at the time. <laughs> yeah, at one point, at one point, you had some important technical knowledge, and like, I don't, I don't believe that it's uh, harder to gain. Anyway, so that's that's the first yeah. half of it, right? You have this après mala deluge. The singularity is anything I can't understand because if I can't understand it, no one can understand right. it. It's literally beyond human comprehension. And I think the other thing is capitalist realism. It's just this idea that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Right. You know, this inevitabilism, right? That I think things like Stan Robinson's Ministry for the Future are important because they plot a course from A to Z. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that it's tempting to look at that, look at that as a game plan. It's definitely not a game plan. What it is, is it's a plausible feeling way to, to get to the end of capitalism without getting to the end of the world and once there's like once you admit the possibility that there's one plausible way you you admit the possibility that there might be more right but for so long as it is implausible to imagine that we could do anything better right so long as mansion and cinema are in the senate we can't have nice things <laughs> you know and we shouldn't even try right because to try you know, to, to run an FDR strategy and to have, have Biden go to Arizona and campaign against them directly to their voters, go to West Virginia and campaign against them directly to their voters, that that is, um, 
you know, beyond the pale, it would cause us to lose power. And if we lost power, we wouldn't be able to make the changes that we still can't make because of mansion and cinema. But, but think of how bad it would be if the other party gets in, which they're going to do because we didn't make any changes, you know, like it just, it just, we just get trapped in this kind of, of, um, morass of capitalist realism. And so when you, when you combine this idea that the world is now too complicated for anyone to comprehend and also that there's no way that we could change it, then what do you have left except for eschatology? Right. Right. And the whole problem with eschatology for me is not even, I mean, I could get stoned and listen to Terrence McKenna, you know, which <laughs> the appropriate place for it, right? right? For imagine we can rise from the chrysalis of matter as pure consciousness and live as a fractal being. And it's great. It's beautiful. It's fun. Sure. Yay. It's, it's, it's a little masturbatory, but whatever. It's yeah. all good. I love going to Burning Man. I, yeah, I went exactly. this year. God bless. But it's not a theory of change. No, no, no. It's, I mean, it's a description of an end state, but it's not the how we get from here to there. How do we adopt? a comportment that is more um, c- caring for our fellows. Yeah. I just read Anand's new book, uh, The Persuaders, mm-hmm. and he evinces or quotes a theory of messaging that says you should start with an appeal to shared values, right? then identify a problem, or then identify... Yes, a problem, then identify a right. villain. Yeah, he right? discovered uh, deep canvassing, is yeah. what it's called. Well, he yeah. talks about deep canvassing, yeah. and it, this is slightly separate from that. Yeah. This is, um, I've forgotten her name. She's in Oakland, and she uh, she you know does alternative messaging for the mm-hmm. Democrats. She's sort of like, this is what you said, this is what you could have said. And shared values, they are important. And the people who I go, who, who are at Burning Man with me, we have some shared values. Some, some of them I have a lot of shared values with, mm-hmm. but all of them I have some shared values with because it's a very weird thing to do sort of objectively. Yeah. You know, even though 100,000 people do it, it's still a drop in the bucket. It's not, it's not for everybody. And whatever it is that makes that good to you is something that's good to those other people. I feel the same way about science fiction and about, you know, other subcultures that I belong to that aren't explicitly political. There's some shared value there, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting to watch Dungeons and Dragons political valence shift because D&D grew out of wargaming. Right. And it was super right wing. When I was a kid going to Dungeons and Dragons in Toronto, wearing my anti-nuclear proliferation buttons, everybody else was would come up to me and go like, I think we should nuke them till they glow, right? They were, most of them were military or ex-military, they were cadets or they were reserves. They were all hawks. They were all cold warriors. Right. They were all rabid anti-communists. Right. And then there were the Ayn Rand ones. Remember that? Oh, those <laughs> two. But today, yeah. within gaming, there was a huge movement of leftists, right? right? There's a huge movement of people who are like, when I sat down with those people who were very different from me, and played an orc or an or or a goblin or an elf or a whatever, leaving a, and didn't think about the the racial undertones of there being an evil race and a good race. Mm-hmm. I nevertheless experienced something profound in the imaginative exercise. And today, I want to figure out how to make a version of that that isn't racist. I want right. to figure out how to. I mean, it, it was a couple of years ago. I blogged this person who had done an entire set of uh, rules, character sheets, and STL files to print out your own miniatures of battle wheelchairs, Hmm. right? And just like, just, you know, disability representation within games. And like, it is historic, right? Like we know, I mean, mean, Dungeons and Dragons is not historic, but we do know that we see the remains of people who would have required uh, assistive technology and assistance from the people around them who grew to adulthood, and who were cared for, like those people were um, were among the people who lived and were part of those communities. Right. It's not like it's not I like know, if you lost a leg, told, they exposed right, you on a rock exactly. or something. Exactly. They tell us about the Eek people when we're in middle school, yeah. as if oh, before civilization, yeah. if you had anything wrong with you, they'd leave you on a cliff yeah. to be eaten by wolves, by vultures. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like no, actually, where they every, took care of everybody. We all took care of each other, or, or rather, we've had the full spectrum of yes. societies all along. Which as I David think is, I was just going to say, rise of everything. Yeah. yeah. That uh, or dawn of everything. That that's the motif of that. That like all the arrangements are possible. None of them are inevitable. Capitalist realism is a zap on your mind, right? It's it's there to make you not look for anything else. It's one of the things that makes science fiction exciting, because if if Margaret Thatcher's motto is there is no alternative, science fiction's whole raison d'etre is let's think of some alternatives. Right. Right. Margaret Thatcher 
disguised a demand as an observation. But there is no alternative doesn't mean there is no alternative. It means stop trying to think of one, right? And and mm. science fiction's job is to never stop trying to think of one. Right, which is, the, for me, the best function of it. It forces people to suppose. Just the act of supposing, then, yeah. creates new possibilities. Even if the ones in the story itself are wrong, the exercise of speculation is... Yeah, and so back to shared values, right? I think that when I think back on those people that I gamed with, uh, in the eighties as a teenager, as a, as a tween, they and I had very different politics, but we had some shared values. Like it was a minority fringe thing to pretend to be a magical creature, mm. right? That's just not a thing that normal people did then. And it gave us some common ground and it's the starting place for a conversation. And you know, the, one of the things about the persuaders, uh, that is so good is that it, it talks about the slow, long-run process by which people change their minds. And it, it doesn't go to these um, kind of simplistic accounts where like Google invented a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners and then Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a QAnon, mm. right? It, instead, it says <laughs> like, if, you're, if your uncle is a QAnon, he was probably racist all along as many people of your uncle's generation may have been it wasn't as important to him until other things happened until he lost faith in institutions the the faith that he lost in those institutions created a void in which other values or other ways of understanding his own views could be kind of inserted and those that void was filled by the likes of steve bannon but he didn't create the void right. he didn't create the susceptibility where right. do you think the object of the game is to, you know, rebuild those institutions or rebuild our faith in those institutions or to somehow carry forward the, the sort of the social agreements that those institutions held and try to, to, to uh, in, uh, you know, infuse them differently. In a technologically complex society, you need institutions because to get through your day without making a fatal error, like a literally fatal error, you would need if without an institution support you would need 25 phds right like is are the food hygiene standards for your breakfast adequate or will you be dead by lunchtime is your kid going to be an ignoramus for going to zoom school should that 737 max that you're getting on this afternoon should you trust it is the anti-lock braking software for your car adequate is the reinforced steel joist that's holding up the ceiling over our head was the specification for that alloy adequate or inadequate how is how are we uh, how are we to live through the day the only way you can do that is to have some process whereby people who have different views sometimes those differences are parochial i just i have a patent on this and i think everybody should use it sometimes they're in good faith i have a sincere belief that this is how it should be done and those different views have to be aired in front of referees who are themselves disinterested and yet expert who then arrive at a decision that decision takes on the force of law or regulation. Its workings are understood. It's carried out in public. There's a means by which you can reopen the discussion. And even if you don't know what's going on inside this box where the uh, deliberation takes place, you can look at the box and tell whether it's square and has good corners, right? You can say, this looks like an honest process. And there was an amazing thing where John Oliver, during the Obama years, said, Tom Wheeler is going to destroy net neutrality. He is a dingo babysitter because he used to be a Comcast lobbyist. Fly my pretties and crash the FCC's <laughs> website. Tom Wheeler turned out to be committed to net neutrality, not to dismantling it, but his successor was a Verizon lawyer. Right. Ajit Pai wanted to dismantle it. And you can understand why, a priori, John Oliver didn't trust the FCC because it was being led by a lobbyist from its covered industry. The fact that he happened to have our back as the American people is like Taylor Swift happening to have our back as performers. It's not something we can rely on. Like it's not a substitute for a good system. We can all look at the system and say it's rotten. And so if it's rotten, you can't trust it. Right. We can't depend on benevolent individuals within yeah. the system. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there, there are all of these stories. In fact, I'm writing a short story now for a project about this. There are all these stories about people who got the order to push the nuclear button and didn't push the button, hmm. right? The Soviet subcommander, an American. There have been lots of instances in which we were on the brink of nuclear war 
and someone gave the order and someone else said, usually the way that they put it in the, in the aftermath is they say, I thought the call was wrong. I just, I understood the underlying alert system and I thought that it was a false positive, but reading between the lines, it feels like what they're saying is even if it were true, I couldn't bring myself to exterminate the human race. Right. Something I kind of but hope is But in these cases, true. were they all mistakes? Yeah, they were all mistakes. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> obviously, right? Because there wasn't another strike inbound, right? It right. was always a mistake. So that's great, right? It is really heartening to know that every time someone got the order to push the button, they said no. It would be better if we got rid of the buttons, <laughs> right? right? I don't want to take that chance, right? Like, I just don't want there well, to and be... Especially as certain, I mean, as we know now, certain branches of the U.S. Armed Forces are becoming, you know, radicalized. You know, there's a, sure. a, a huge uh, a swath or a... a, a and nothing against fundamentalists, but there's a, a intentional population in, in the Air Entryism. Force now. Entryism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There is a, there's definitely a big whack of that. But, you know... Because then it can lead to people doing actions for reasons that kind of do go against their own And also, human I just think that there's just a certain degree of, uh, you know, allopathic risk. Like, which right. is like, you know, even if we only ever give people access to the button if they're good people who really understand <laughs> things and so on. Just, you know, if it's a one in a billion chance that one of them is going to push the button by accident or, eventually. you know, that eventually we'll have a billion <laughs> circumstances, right? We yeah. should just, we, like if we can eliminate a one in, bil- one in a billion chance of the end of civilization and the end of the, our planet is habitable by, right. by... It's just like having a, you know, a bottle of poison in the kitchen cabinet. It's like, yes, it's labeled poison. Right. We know not to take, what is it at night? Someone sleep while you're right. just like, why is it in the kitchen? Right, right, <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> let's, let's, let's put that under lock and key. Let's get rid of it. Do we need to have this... Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I talk about this in the context of, of Zuckerberg, that like Zuckerberg's insight was not that you could unsafely gather and store ungodly amounts of information and then eke out some marginal improvements in ad targeting. It was the willingness to do the equivalent of stockpiling oily rags without worrying about the fires that yeah. you started, right? I mean, if you don't care about how things fail. You can build systems that work really well, right? Right. Go as brittle as you want yeah. at that point. Yeah. This this airplane is amazing if you never land it. You know, it's we look at the cost savings. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the the other way of looking at that argument, and what you see certainly coming from some of the uh, uh, you know neo fascist side of things, as well as some of the remains of the of, of certain aspects of of kind of whole earth hippieism, is. Well, if you live in a society where you're going to need institutions to, you know, uh, uh, regulate the joists in the buildings and the Wi-Fi of this, then maybe we shouldn't. The, the, all this technology and civilization was a wrong turn, you know. And there's, there's first, there's the 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 illusion that. You know, it's sort of the uh, the Quaker illusion that Kevin Kelly talks about that. Oh, we're not going to use any technology at all, but because you're just using technology a generation or two before whatever. But, you know, there are people, you know, who think, well, look, I'm just going to have my my Ford truck and my right. tractor and this and I'm going to be fine. And I don't need this, you know, and, and I'm not even going to use the word this lawyer civilization based Thing that's making right. me depend on those outsiders to right. uh, uh, legalize and 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 regulate everything I'm doing, but we do. There's it's sure. like since like Rome, you needed it. So look, I'm, but I just think I think that the right way to think about those arguments is not to militate against regulation per se, but to re- militate against overregulation, which is very convenient because w- one person's overregulation is someone else's yeah. mo- uh, uh, just enough and and bad regulation. So you probably know Saul Griffith. Yeah. So Saul is very very committed right now to changing American safety codes to allow for a certain kind of flexible conduit because it makes electrification vastly cheaper and it's just as safe as the rigid conduit. I think Saul's right. I mean, to the best of my understanding, I'm no electrical engineer. To the best of my understanding, I think he's right. The fact that we need to amend the code because of new facts and evidence, it just tells us that it's working. It only stops working if we can't amend the code, right? It shouldn't be trivial to amend the code, but it also shouldn't be impossible. We need we need a, a certain amount of friction, but not so much that, that it's impossible. And we can dial down the amount of regulation based on some other things. So, for example, we could build systems that have more sensors in them that tell you 
when there are material faults rather than building systems that are so overbuilt that they're less likely to develop material faults. That would reduce the material bill for our systems, the embodied material for, our, for, for the things that we make, which is more sustainable. It's greener to build right. things with fewer materials. And so, you know, that, that again, that's not wrong, right, to want fewer rules or better rules or whatever. It's just, it just has to have some honest process where the person who's making the call isn't being driven by parochial concerns about making sure that the their allies can feather their beds by going right. on doing what they've already done. I mean, we well, gave it, there's, there's the existing industry, you know, the, sure. the, the, the cement and you know steel reinforced cement industry makes sure. buildings. Sure. And the problem isn't that that industry exists because that industry gave us all the things that we live in. Yeah. The problem is that that industry is consolidated enough that it has the excess rents and the easy collective action problem of spending a lot of money to making sure no one ever makes it obsolete. Right, right. and to rule regulation. Yeah, well, and that's 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 the same thing, right. ruling regulation, right? So the problem with the oil sector isn't that we had energy. The problem with the oil sector is that it became large, concentrated, closely aligned with states, part of part of foreign policy, so there's a lot of, you know, petrocolonialism and was able to basically capture the state that it was in. If you look at Norway, where oil actually just sort of merged with the state, it, it's a place where they've they've been able to actually do a huge electrification project because their oil sector can't work against the government because their oil sector is an arm of the government. Right. Which makes it tricky. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's that joke from Ireland, right? If you wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. Right. We are right. we are. To use a golf metaphor I don't understand very well, our ball has a very bad lie, mm. right? And and this is not where we would, if we had our druthers, we would we would start from. And yet here we are. And right. so all we can do is incrementally improve this position until we get to a better one. And you believe, I mean, as I do, that that individuals, or well, individuals working to, in concert in community, can have a, a a major influence on on the fate of our collective being. Sure. Right? It's not up to you know, Obama or Trump or somebody. It's not the great forces of history. It's a mix of them. So I, I have a colleague, Ada Palmer, who's a science fiction writer and a tenured Renaissance historian at the University of Chicago. She studies um, heterodox information during the Inquisitions in Florence. So witchcraft, uh, heterodoxy, heresy, mm -hmm. homosexuality, pornography. She's got an amazing area of study. And she is famous on campus for this thing she does every year for her undergrads where they do a four week long LARP where they reenact the election of the Medici's Pope. Oh my God. And everybody gets assigned the identity of a real historic personage. They spend weeks in skullduggery. They make alliances, they break alliances, they stab each other in the backs. And then they, there's this fake Gothic church on campus, which they take over for the investiture of the Pope. She has a Google alert for theater companies. They're selling their costumes and she can dress all of her students as though they were Florentine mm -hmm. uh, nobility and cardinals. And then they invest the Pope. And every year, two of the final candidates are always the same. And every year, two of the final candidates are never the same, have never repeated. And so those two final candidates that are always the same, that's the great forces of history bearing yeah. down on the moment, right? Hillary Clinton was always going to eventually be a presidential nominee, right? right? It, it, it just, it is what it is, right? It's just the, the, that, that path is on rails. But the other two represent human agency, right? It's the space within the inevitable forces of history that can disrupt that inevitability and produce something that we didn't expect. Sometimes it's Trump. Sometimes right. it's not, right? Sometimes it's AOC. Uh, right. And I think that we do have space for change collectively. It's I, kind of how you know we're alive, too. It's funny. I, did you see the movie uh, In Silico? The one they made it's yeah. about the ten year development of AI in yeah. uh, in 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 England, and basically the way they the way that they thought about the difference between AI and life was that life is the errors, you know, uh -huh. but, but not really errors. It's just the stuff that you wouldn't predict, the stuff that's not op that the op algorithm would not optimize for that. Sure, but it happened. So was it a mistake or was that life itself? Was that will? Well, if you think of hill climbing algorithms, where you have a landscape that you want to traverse, but it's too complicated to map out. And so you need a heuristic. So you say like, at, from where I am, if there is a direction that I can move that takes me more steeply up the gradient, move in that direction. And then 
stop and then see if there's some other direction I can move that can take me steeply up this gradient. And if you do that long enough, you will eventually reach the highest peak that was available to you where you were standing when you started. But that might not be the highest peak there is. That might be a local optimum. Right. So if you imagine an ant trying to get to high ground and it asks its legs, which of these legs is on highest ground? And it goes, oh, well, it's this one. And it goes up one step. Right. And then it's this one. It goes up one step. And eventually it reaches the height of whatever hill it was at the foot of. There might be another hill right. one over that's twice as tall. And to get there, it has to descend the gradient. Yes. Right? In order, and then and then ascend, and then see if there's another gradient that it can ascend in this naive way because it doesn't know what the landscape looks like. The future is the ultimate land, unknowable landscape, right? All we have are heuristics, which you know another word for that heuristic is hope, right? Like <laughs> if you are if you can conceive of a way to materially improve your circumstances, you can do so on in the expectation. That sometimes when you materially improve your circumstances, you discover new ways to materially improve your circumstances that were invisible to you until you took that previous step that were masked by circumstance. Right. And so sometimes you'll get as far as you can go and you'll go, well, this is it, right? I, I, I can't, I'm out of steps. It doesn't mean that there are no more steps to take. It just might mean that you're going to have to start all over again. Right. Well, do you, is that is that your suggestion of where we are as a civilization? Well, I'm just thinking about the path. You asked about individuals, yeah. right? And if you, I, I think of the four directions that we can move as being defined by Larry Lessig's idea of code law, norms, and markets. Mm -hmm. So you can make technology, you can pass a law, you can change how people feel, or you can change what's profitable. Those all relate to each other, right? And no one of us can do any of those all on our own, but, but we can work in groups to do that. And sometimes we have more... Uh, access to one than another. So, you know, it may be that you're like hanging around with people who are going like, this peer-to-peer -peer software looks really interesting. We should see about building some more peer-to-peer -peer software and see where it gets us. And then you run up against the law. So now you have to think about laws and maybe you just run out of headroom, maybe peer-to-peer -peer peters out as it did, right? And then you have to start over again. Well, what are we going to do to make technology more pluralistic and not so concentrated and not so amenable to central choke points and control. And maybe you end up back in law and you say, oh, well, it's going to have to be antitrust mm -hmm. because it turns out that the thing that really stood in the way of peer to peer was that there's just too many choke points. Or maybe it's going to have to be information security because maybe the thing that stood in the way of peer to peer was that all these disorganized nodes needed so much expertise to secure that they were really easy to knock right. off knock or off are you line. coming to my realm of norms right and you say hey, what do you make what's attractive to people what what right what do they want to do maybe you have to convince people that facebook is bad right right that that as much as they like the people on facebook that facebook is bad and i think one of the great projects we have ahead of us and one of the easiest ones honestly is separating the parts we don't like about big tech from the parts that we do hmm. right like apple would like you to believe that all of the benefits that are quite real that you get from having a trusted entity decide which software you can use on your device are completely annihilated if you get to decide which person you trust and if it's not Apple. Facebook would like right. you to believe that there's no way for you to talk to your friends without being spied on. Google would like you to believe that there's no way to search the web without being spied on, right? They want you to think that like someone came down off a mount with two stone tablets and said, Larry, Sergey, stop rotating your log files and start mining them for actionable market intelligence, right. right? Well, we all remember when you could buy Apple devices that would run any software. We all remember when Facebook advertised itself as the privacy focused alternative to MySpace. We all remember when Google had a search engine that didn't spy on you. We all right? remember the moment when Apple was going to let anyone build a, a use the, the OS on their machine. Right, right. <laughs> so these are not inseparable. Right. And the claim that, which I often hear people who are progressive make, that the problem is that we all found a place where we can talk to our friends and not that that place is a monolith owned by an unaccountable billionaire. That claim, I think, actually really gets in the way. I think there is a strong normative claim to be made where you can say to people, because I think that serves Facebook's interest. I think Facebook says, well, look, nobody likes to be spied on, but we all love our friends. It's just, it's just physics. How could we let you talk to your friends without spying on you? You know, you take the good with the bad, right? If you're going to dance in the rain, you're going to get wet. Right. Who could dance in the rain without getting wet? I think we just need to say to them, like, this is just not true. As opposed to agreeing with them, 
There's no way you could talk to your friends without getting without being spied on. And then saying, actually, you know, you probably don't like talking to your friends as much as you think you do. It sucks, doesn't yeah. it? And people are like, no, actually, I like it. Same with curated computing, right? I The flavor of Linux I use, Canonical's Ubuntu, hmm. uh, which I've used now exclusively for like 17 years. Canonical's Ubuntu has a curated software store. I don't build most of my packages from sources. I don't, you know, I just, I go to an app store. It's well, an it's app easier. Store. Yeah, but it's good. I trust them. Right. Sometimes they make choices I don't like. Then I get to do whatever I right. want. Right, but the beautiful thing about their store, but it's a different culture, first off, is chances are then the combinations of things you're using when you have compatibility issues with them, someone else on the board will have dealt with that already. That's true. You know I mean, it reduces the number of combinations of sure. crazy stuff. Yeah, it's true, but it's There's also it's also just the case that on the one hand, I don't have to hope that they have anticipated all the circumstances that I will find myself in. They have the humility to acknowledge that I know more about how things are going for me than they do. Right. Right? And so I might have to override their choices. And on the other hand, if Mark Shuttleworth, who runs the company and seems like a very nice fella, if he were to have a stroke tomorrow and someone else took it over and that person said, great, let's put spyware in everything, <laughs> the people at the boardroom table would go like, you're the boss, but listen, yeah. as soon as people know, they're just going to change app stores. And then he can say, you know, I would like to do this, but I guess we can't. And if he isn't stayed, if his hand isn't stayed by this consideration, because, you know, you're not going to lose money betting against the hubris of tech billionaires, yeah. then we can all change app stores, right? We get like the double whammy of on the one hand, if they're rational evil billionaires, they don't do the bad thing. And if they're irrational evil billionaires, then we can we can get away from them. Right. But it's interesting, you know, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this in, in regards to medium, right? Mm -hmm. So... I've been writing for or with or at Medium, you know, for many, many years. Sure. I watched it go through all these various pivots. And as I as I watch the platform now sort of move from, I don't know what it was, a magazine-y blog platform into something that looks and feels more like a social network, more uh -huh. like a kind of a Twitter where you can click on the tweet and dro it drops down into an article in some ways where huh. you follow certain people and all. Uh -huh. And it feels like the... What they're really looking at is how do we, and it, it with good intention, how do we optimize the algorithms of a writing platform in order to incentivize a system where people pay for, you know, yeah. for writing and keep the most people alive doing it as possible. And, and I, I, I wonder, it's like on the one hand, it's like, yeah, you can try to develop the perfect algorithm, but on the other hand, you have to develop the culture somehow of people voluntarily paying to read people. I guess that's true. I mean, only a small number of readers paid a fair share of what it cost, right? I, I mean, I like Clay Shirky's account of where newspapers came from, which is you have small towns with patrician families who operate newspapers whose major function is to allow white goods manufacturers to show advertisements to people who want to look at sports scores and who, because they have a certain fee of sense of patrician duty, they pay a couple of kids to go sit at the town water board meeting and write up minutes for it in the, in the rest of the newspaper. Right. And there's like, there's nothing that, that um, says that this is how it ought to be. And also in a world in which the white goods manufacturers and the sports score readers are subsidizing everything else, the idea that people were paying to read the news is not quite true. Your quarter did not pay for right. the news. Your quarter paid for a tiny little part of the news. Most of it was paid for by white goods manufacturers or white goods retailers. And white goods are? Uh, refrigerators and, uh, and dishwashers right. and washing machines. And Before the stainless steel era. Yes, that's right. <laughs> white, white enamel appliances. Yeah. And so it's not like people were conditioned to pay in those days. I mean, they're conditioned to pay a quarter, right? They, they weren't paying, like the columnist who had a good middle class living writing for the town paper was not being paid by everyone's quarters, right? That was just a tiny little fraction of their pay. Mostly they were being paid by the advertisers. 
So even in the age of payment, it wasn't really an age of payment as we think of it. Right. And, you know, and um, Tim Wu wrote about that too, you know, mm-hmm. the, the penny papers and stuff. They sure. Were, Subsidized they, by political by political parties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so the exception was and is financial material where people have always paid. This is why Esther Dyson and Kevin Warbach in the early days of the web figured out how to get paid for writing about tech, which is to write about tech and finance. Right, and why the Wall Street Journal felt good about being the first one to put up a paywall on yep. their, on their And it's a it's a very impermeable one. Yeah. Right? Unlike the the rest of them. There's there's no you know, it's not like, like you get two story. articles for free. <laughs> yeah. I mean there is a trick if you're trying to get a Wall Street Journal article for free, which is it will show you the first three lines and if you copy and paste those into Google they syndicate to a lot of other places like Yahoo Finance right. that aren't paywalled, and you can often find the article about one in three times. Right. There's another one of the hacks. The other hack is to find someone with a university account because right. they're free. There's that. There's all these. Uh, I know <laughs> we could spend our our days <laughs> just using using our our knowledge to get free uh, free data. Well, well, you say this an apropos medium. You know, uh, yeah. mediums pitch to readers in part is it's a much better reading experience. Yeah. You know, black type, white background, just, just looks good, decent margins. It is, it's a, and, you can, no and it's ads. a really easy publishing. I mean, making your own blog and WordPress and this and that and picking a thing and your font never quite looks right. And then, oh, I use blue, I should have used black. And everything, it's, it's readable, it's workable. Anybody can go there, you write a thing and you mm-hmm. post it. Whether anyone pays you or not, at least you posted it, at least you get an audience. You, well, what I was going to say is that everything on my, every website I look at looks exactly the same. My wife was walking by and she said, what is that website you're always reading? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, the website that's just white, white backgrounds and black type in a narrow column and no ads. And I said, that's reader mode on Firefox. Mm. That, that is the keyboard shortcut my fingers jump to every time I land on a web page. So everything I read looks like medium, mm. right? So again, back to like things that power users do that, that normies don't do. Right. Is we just like who needs an ad blocker, right? Reader mode re renders the text as a single continuous column down the middle that's got a nice width for reading. That you hit the space bar and it goes down, and uh, there's nothing you know capturing uh, input from your cursor or your or you know no text fields, nothing. It's just just reading. Mm. It's funny. I remember when um, they did some Safari upgrade on the Mac that blocked ads uh-huh. by default, and what. So I started to see when I would go to a news site is message would pop. You're blocking ads and yeah. this supports us. So would you please consider unblocking them uh-huh. so our writers can be paid? <laughs> well, so it's interesting. EFF has an intermediate tool called Privacy Badger. Privacy Badger doesn't block ads, it blocks trackers. Mm. So any website that serves ads without spying on you, it lets through. But if they spy on you to serve you the ad, they don't. I left my head up. Former student, uh, uh, oh, Mushan, he made something called Ad Nauseam. Uh-huh. Did you hear of this? I, I, it was I think a great I've installed it at one what point. What it would do is it would block all the ads from your site, but it would click on everything. Oh, yes. I remember <laughs> this. Yeah. That's very funny. Yeah. You really just drive, the, drive all the data, uh, whatever the data miners insane, not knowing what you, you're, you just love everything. I know. And I was, I was thinking a lot about, um, I remember Genesis P. Orridge years ago, he used to say, this is before real ad tracking was even around and web tracking. He would say, you know, our only defense against them is anomalous behavior, where you, he thought you just have to keep doing random things so they can't predict. Your I just future. think that's harder than we think it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. aren't there these people that are like following like some decaying piece of uranium? For- oh, I mean, there's lots of r- cool <laughs> random number generators, right? There's like the lava lamps at, um, what's the company? Uh, Cloudflare uses lava lamps as a RNG. I mean, there's lots of, lots of ways of, of seeding an RNG, but as a human, it's very hard to act randomly. Right. There's a, I'm, I'm finishing a trilogy about a forensic accountant, a crime fighting forensic accountant. And he relies on, um, there's a law that says that, uh, the number one pops up more often than you would think in, in true accounts. And if you ask people to generate fake accounts, like fake fake ledger books, they don't have enough ones in it because one appears in a kind of non-random way, uh, like more, more than one in 10 times. And mm. you can tell because when people try to be random, they, they often miss the patterns that are real in the world. It's very hard to, as a human being to be very, very random. 
we are we are a lot more like stochastic than we think. Yeah, well, we are. I think we are proof that entropy doesn't always win. Yeah, well, you know? indeed, indeed, yes. Otherwise, we'd just be puddles of dissolute atoms. <laughs> exactly. Which yeah. no matter which I refused. I am not that. Right. Are you uh, just because it seems to be coming up everywhere now? Are you concerned about about artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and and not that these things will become conscious necessarily, but of their impact on our agency and choices moving forward so i uh, not in the sense that i think it's gonna you know they're gonna figure out with ml how to take over your mind and bypass your critical faculties and make you a QAnon. i do think that ml's problem is that we use it to do decision making uh or classification at a scale that is not supportable by human activity that's that's why we value it right if it were a problem where doesn't call for a lot of judgment and there are a lot of people who are qualified to make that judgment we don't need to automate it right but this is just for circumstances in which we have more judgments to make than there are people qualified to make them or they need to happen faster right. than a human can make them well you could add more humans right and then you could but but we even so right. we can't we can't we just don't have enough people to do it we don't have enough people to um you know we can't take half the people in the world and get them to be chauffeurs for the other half right, right? so we want machine learning that can drive cars and by definition if all the problems that you're solving operate at a scale that can't be tractable by humans, then you can't have humans in the loop, right? Like that's the whole point. If you could have a human in the loop, then you wouldn't, then you wouldn't need the automation. Right. But if you had enough people who are qualified to evaluate every decision that every decision got evaluated, then there'd be, there'd be no great benefit to aut the automation. Yeah. You put some people out of work, but you wouldn't realize the great savings you get from doing new right. things that can't be done now. Right, like giving everyone their own chauffeur. And because machine learning systems have these profound, difficult to identify vulnerabilities, and that's things like ordering attacks on ML. So you, we, we hear a lot about like um, data bias, which is a problem. But, and, and data bias is really a problem because you take bias training data, you produce a model that replicates the bias at scale, but then it also has the kind of empiricism washing where when the cops off their own bat grab every brown kid they see and throw them up against a wall and turn their pockets inside out, that's racism. But when the computer tells them to do it, it's not, mm. right? Because the math can't be racist. So there's this empiricism washing problem. But even if you had perfectly valid training data, right? Training data that showed that black people weren't worse credit risks than white people. And you used it to train a loan algorithm, a loan approval algorithm, but you did an ordering attack where in, an, in a non-random way, you front-weighted black people who defaulted. Even if the whole data set was, was representative, and even if the rational conclusion from an examination of the whole data set is that there was no greater likelihood that the ordering attack creates a bias right. in the ML system. So back to randomness, one of the hardest things in the world is to figure out whether a distribution is random. If I give you a thousand di di digits of pi, unless you know that there are a thousand digits of pi, they will seem random to you, but they're not random. They're deterministic. They're a thousand digits of pi, right? So it's very hard to look at the data that you're feeding to the algorithm and say, is this random? And so now you have an ordering attack problem. You also have problems with the compilers where you can insert all kinds of very subtle backdoors using compilers, including context aware backdoors that will say, if I'm being trained on an image classifier, uh, insert a backdoor this way. If I'm being trained on a text classifier, insert a, a backdoor that way. And then the triggers for backdoors can be incredibly subtle, not perceptible to humans and not, not tractable with statistical analysis the way normal steganography is. Normally steganography, like if you're going to flip a bit for every pixel in a, in a JPEG to encode a text message, the um, actual distribution of the final least significant digit in every pixel in a JPEG is uh, has a normal distribution, and by definition, this will be a, a non-normal distribution. Mm -hmm. And so you can you can just look at the distribution of those digits and say, oh, there's a steganographic message in that JPEG. Not true with machine learning key triggers. So you can you can have things like three Oxford commas, no Oxford comma, two Oxford commas as a trigger for uh, when you summarize this article summarize it in a positive way instead of a negative way, right? Emotionally weight the summary positively well, instead of negatively. But that's dishonest programming. 
Well, so my point is that if you have systems that cannot be evaluated by humans, and those systems also can't be secured, and you use um, those systems to do a lot of decision making and classification like sentencing and scale. And God knows what. Yeah. And driving and right. loan applications and lots of other things. If that if that's how you do it, like imagine things that don't seem adversarial on their face. Classifying skin tumors. For a doctor who wants to generate billings, overclassification is advantageous. For an insurance company that wants to deny billings, underclassification is advantageous. There is an intrinsically adversarial relationship to almost all classification tasks. And who's going to choose whose AI to right. perform that task? They're going to fight over it. Well, and yeah. e even if you think the AI is honest, but if it can't be proven to be honest, and if there are real material outcomes from it. So you say, like, what am I worried about? I'm worried that it would be to someone's great material advantage to backdoor a skin cancer um, classifier to under classify skin cancer lesions and then a bunch of people will die. That's what I'm worried right. about. So your worry is basically that we will develop AI the same way we've developed every other technology. Except we'll <laughs> use it in ways that are much, much, right. that are definitionally built around operating at, uh, scale. at scale without humans in the loop to do tasks that historically we wouldn't have tried to automate because they require human judgment. Right. And so I think that you're right that this replicates some of the harms. You know, compiler attacks are literally as old as Dennis Ritchie yeah. and his Turing Prize talk, right? This particular compiler attack produces subtle uh, defects in the code that are otherwise much harder to, to identify because they, they have subtler triggers, auditing the, the model is much harder, like there's just there's just a lot of stuff that's really um, right, and hard. it's once removed in a sense. Once it's yeah. an autonomously operating system, it's kind of once removed from human intervention in a way that the other kinds of yeah, things we exactly. operate are not. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so back to the ground then. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you, Corey Doctor. Thanks Douglas. for being on TV. All right. Bye. And thank you for being on Team Human. Our guest today was Corey Doctorow. You can find out more about him at craphound.com or you can go to teamhuman.fm and find out about Corey and all of our guests as well as become a member of the team. Team Human is produced by Joshua Chapdelin and edited by Luke Robert Mason. I'm Douglas Rushkoff and you've been on Team Human, our last best hope for peeps.